There's one key concept required to understand the origins debate. If you don't get this concept, you won't get the whole issue. Today on Creation Magazine Live, the key to understanding the creation evolution debate. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Today on the program, we're going to talk about one of the most vital concepts to understand. If you don't get this, the whole issue <laughs> isn't going to make sense. Right. And uh, it, it's ironically one of the most ignored and misunderstood as well. Uh, if you don't understand this, un having a meaningful dialogue with someone who has the opposite opinion, whether creationist or evolutionist, right. is... Um, is just not going to work. And you're not going to fully be able to understand your own position either. So it's a vital concept. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, clearing this up is going to uh, get more meaningful dialogue going between creationists yes. and evolutionists because yep. oftentimes they're just talking past each other. And for Christians, this is really important to understand um, because if you're trying to engage someone about the origins debate and you don't define this, you're going to get yourself uh, in, in a lot of trouble. You just got to, sometimes the, the communication becomes meaningless. So. What we're talking about here is the ability to discern between operational and historical science. That's the key thing. That's, That's what we're yeah. talking about here. Yeah, without an ability to uh, read an article or watch a documentary or read a book or, or, or something on the origins debate uh, and, and have the ability to discern between the two, it's going to be extremely difficult to understand the whole debate. That's right. uh, part of the reason this is so foundational is because if you can discern the difference between historical and operational science, you also end up understanding to a great extent the relationship between faith and science when it comes to the origins issue. That's right. Now let's start with some definitions. Um, we're going to look at some practical examples in a few minutes and, and hopefully yeah. you know, this will be very clear by the end of that. But uh, for a good definition between operational and historical science, let's turn to a leading evolutionary uh, biologist, Ernst Mayer. Now, Stephen Jay Gould, a well-respected evolutionist, yes, uh, yep. probably the best well-known uh, evolutionist, once described Dr. Mayer as the world's greatest living evolutionary biologist. So obviously Mayer is a, was a well-respected uh, evolutionist. Here's what Ernst Mayer uh, said about historical science. For example, Darwin introduced hin historicity into science. Evolutionary biology, in contrast with physics and chemistry, is a historical science. The evolutionist attempts to explain events and processes that have already taken place. Laws and exper experiments are inappropriate techniques for the ex explication of such events and processes. Instead, one constructs a historical narrative consisting of a tentative reconstruction of the particular scenario that led to the events one is trying to explain. Now that's, that's a great definition. From an evolutionist. <laughs> from, from an evolutionist, leading evolutionist as well. Yep. He draws a distinction between things that can be observed and things that can't be observed. Right. That's an important distinction. And without understanding that, again, you're not going to understand the whole issue. It's that foundational. Right. I mean, uh, what's remarkable, that this really isn't a hard concept. No, it's not. Right? Like no. Dr. Mayer mentioned chemistry. In yep. chemistry, you can mix some chemicals together. You can observe the results. Uh, that experiment can be repeated, for example. Yeah. You tell somebody yep. else the instructions. Uh, observation and repeatability are the cornerstones of operational science. Right? So if two people disagree, disagree about the boiling point of water at sea level on the planet, well, they can do the experiment. Right. Right? They can yep. do it on different places on the planet, and they're always going to get the same result, which is an yeah. interesting point. Operational science. Right. And yeah. that's the kind of stuff that gives us uh, advances in technology and medicine. Um, it's great stuff. But, but operational science by itself doesn't have anything to do with the origins debate, right? By itself. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now, Dr. Meyer also mentioned that evolutionary biology is a historical science. Right. He said this, the evolutionist attempts to explain events and processes that have already taken place. Laws and experiments are inappropriate techniques for the explication of such events and processes. He gets it. Yeah. He understands. <laughs> you can't observe or repeat the past. Right. And so this is a great definition. For example, uh, the evolution of humans. 
apparently took place over millions of years, a long time ago when no one observed it. Right. And likewise, the, the flood of Noah took place a long time ago, and nobody alive today observed those events happening. Right. There, there are things that happened in the past, and creation evolution, that's exactly what, what we're talking about. Right. So historical science does involve making observations. For example, you can observe rock layers containing fossils. We can observe genetic changes from generation to generation, uh, right. rivers carrying sediment to the ocean, etc. Um, so, so then you can ask the question, well, how did those things originate? But we need to be able to decipher the difference between how they originated and, and, and what we see today. And we'll get into this a little bit more with some practical examples when we get back. According to skeptics, one of the characteristics of pseudo-scientific theory is that it contradicts a known scientific law. For instance, in biology, we have the law of biogenesis, which states that life only comes from life. Ironically, though, many self-professed skeptics ignore this scientific law when it comes to the origin of life. According to evolutionary theory, all life on Earth can be traced back to a single-celled organism, which itself arose from non-living chemicals. But this is a clear contradiction of the law of biogenesis, and not surprising so far, scientists have been unable to validate this belief. Even Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for co-discovering the structure of DNA, admitted, an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. Well, maybe it was a miracle. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, if you just tuned in, we're talking about one of the key concepts in the creation evolution debate, and that's understanding the difference between observations and the past. And uh, if you want a, a good definition of that, you can go to creation.com slash distinguish. Mm. And there's, uh, the, the definition is laid out there, as it is in many of our articles on creation.com. But uh, you can check that out as well. Now, one of the dreams we <laughs> have for evolutionists is that they would understand this issue as well as Dr. Ernst Meyer that we just quoted from. Uh, seems to. That's right. Uh, I mean, evolutionists, especially a lot of them that will comment on our videos, for example, yes. right? They, they think that historical science is something that creationists made up right. to, to, yeah. you know, so we can argue uh, better, something like that. Because most evolutionists see science, operational and historical, they just lump them all together, That's right. lump yeah. it all together, and, and they don't make the distinction. They call it all science, and, and, and they don't make the distinction between what you can observe and what happened in the past, right? right. For example, yeah. in, in a response to a previous show, we explained, uh, explained the distinction, and, and very quickly, one commenter, this is what he said, guys, you're completely lying, and that's a sin. <laughs> then, then they quoted from what we had said previously, which right. was, people make guesses about what happened in the past to explain what we see today. That's what we had that's said, what, right, yeah. right? And he said, well, science doesn't guess. They infer things from evidence, but those inferences have to be consistent with the evidence. Yeah, well, here's somebody who doesn't understand the distinction that we're talking about today, the difference between <laughs> historical science and, uh, and the, or how that fits into the origins debate, the difference between observations and the past. Right. He says, science doesn't guess. Well, that may be true of operational science, where hypotheses can be verified or falsified and, and, so, on, and so on, but it's not true of historical science. Not at all. Um, if we go back to Dr. Meyer's statement, he said this, one constructs a historical narrative consisting of a tentative reconstruction of the particular scenario that led to the events one is trying to explain. So, said another way, you imagine, or you guess, you, you, you make up a history, you yep. think up a situation in the past that explains what you're observing today. Right. Well, and, even the, this fellow himself, when he said, well, science doesn't guess, but they infer things from evidence, but those inferences have to be consistent with the evidence. He hasn't even realized that he's just agreed with us. You infer yeah. from the evidence because you, don't, you can't make the conclusion because it didn't happen in front of you, right? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, evolutionists often think that creationists disagree with scientific observations, that yeah, we that's... somehow reject science because, you know. But we can't state this clearly enough. I don't know how many times I've had to repeat this. Over right? and over again. Right. But... The disagreement isn't about observations, folks. If you're an evolutionist out there, understand, it's not about what we observe. No. There isn't an observation that a creationist and an evolutionist make that we don't agree with. You know. It's, it's true. And over the years, many of our scientists and speakers have said this in articles and, yeah. and in previous videos we've said it. Uh, we, we've made statements like that, and people are sort of shocked by it. What? Creationists don't, creationists accept every, every 
observation than evolutionists would make? Yes. And again, that belies that folks don't understand this foundational issue. So yep. we need to do a whole show on it. But <laughs> for more details and a, and a much broader definition, have a look at the article called It's Not Science by Dr. Don Batten. Go to creation.com slash it's not science. And you yep. can see that there. Another faulty argument that uh, anti-creationists uh, make uh, those who fail to distinguish the difference between historical science and the observations, is that if it's admitted that God created, that all scientific investigation would cease. Right, but right. Now, responding to one such uh, anti-creationist, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati responded in this way. To explain further, the laws that govern the operation of a computer are not those that made the computer in the first place. Uh, his anti-creationist propaganda is like saying that if we concede that a computer had an intelligent designer, then we might not analyze a computer's workings in terms of natural laws of electron uh, motion through semiconductors, and might think there are little intelligent beings pushing electrons around instead. Similarly, believing that the genetic code was originally designed does not preclude us from believing that it works entirely by the laws of chemistry involving DNA, RNA, proteins, etc. Conversely, the fact that uh, the coding machinery works according to reproducible laws of chemistry does not prove that the laws of chemistry were sufficient to build such a system from a primordial soup. Right, so no, just because creationists or Bible-believing scientists admit that God created doesn't mean they can't do real science. Right. But here's the point. What creationists are saying is that the scientific laws that govern the operation of the universe are not sufficient to account for its origin. Right. That's what we're saying. Creation Magazine is a 56-page, full-color family magazine that is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Visit creation.com to get your subscription. Now we just finished saying that uh, Bible-believing scientists re recognize that the laws that govern the operation of the universe today are insufficient to account for its origin. Okay. Evolutionists say, yes they are. They have to, and they have an uphill battle. <laughs> we can just admit it, they've right. got a lot tougher job. Yeah. Um, many evolutionists tr are trying to explain the origin of the universe using the laws that we see today. Right. And so they're, they're stuck in that, uh, in, it's kind of stuck in a rut. Uh, Dr. Scott, uh, Scott Todd, an immunologist from Kansas State University said, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. Right. So they're locked into a particular way they're of seeing They're stuck things. in a box and yep. that's the, they don't think outside yep. the box, right? You know, if you use a courtroom analogy, uh, which I commonly do when I'm speaking to help clarify this historical operational yes. science, right? You know, you, you, you see one of these uh, shows on TV or whatever, you go to a real courtroom and, and you've got a, a criminal case, let's say. Well, y people have co collected data, right? There's these facts that both sides are privy to, but you've got two opposing sides. Now, even before they show up to take the case, they know which way they're going to argue. This person's on the side of the prosecution. These people over here are defending, right? Right. So, yep. so now they're looking at the exact same facts, and they come to two completely different conclusions based on those same facts because of their starting bias. Yeah. This person here, their job is to take these facts and interpret them according to what their presupposition is. This person's guilty. Yeah, they're paid by their clients yeah, to interpret them that well, way. Well, yeah, well, yeah. the defense <laughs> lawyer is anyway. Like the, the prosecution might not be, but the defense <laughs> lawyer certainly is, right? They're paid to, hey, you, you got to defend me here. Take this yep. evidence and show how I'm innocent. And, and, you know, if you could just understand that, then really, you could just understand this debate so easily. Yeah, some of these anti-creationists think that by admitting that the origins debate involves historical science, that we're somehow using that to invalidate evolution. Right. We're not. That, that's, that, that, that would be in, like invalidating ourselves. Right, because uh, we're in the same boat. It's this historical we're same boat. argument. Yeah. We're, we're simply pointing it out in order to get a dialogue going. And, and uh, uh, think of it as forensic science, the same, going back to the courtroom analogy right. and so on. That's a valid type of science for determining what happened in the past. It's used in the courts, forensic science, a lot like historical science. Right. And it, since operational science only deals with the present, that's the only kind of science that you can use 
to look at things that happened in the past, like a murder case or something. Right. If we said historical science wasn't valid, we'd, we'd, we wouldn't have a case, would we? Yes. Um, now, notice that some sciences uh, blend together both operational and historical science. Geology, for example. Paleontology. Right. right. In geology, we observe rocks. We observe, you know, grain size and the cement that holds them together and other geologic features around the world. Right. And then you ask, how did those things come to be? So you've got observations and you've got that historical bit where you're trying to figure out how it got there. Right. Paleontology, same thing. Here's this animal or this plant in a rock. How did it come to be that way? That's not observed. Exactly. So. You know, forensic science used in murder uh, cases. When you're sequencing a sample of DNA, you know, found at the crime scene, you're making observations. Look, here's a DNA sequence. We've, we've, we've gathered this fact. You, you, you've gathered some facts. Yep. But then all the facts are assembled and interpreted in a way that makes a suspect guilty or innocent, right? The reason the DNA uh, of the butler was found on the deceased is because the butler did it. That's one yes, way of interpreting right, yes. it, right? Then you could say, no, the reason it was found uh, b with the body because the, the butler uh, helped the person up when they slipped on the stairs just before they died. E same fact. Two different ways to explain the, the evidence, right? Right. So Two different histories are constructed yep. to lead to what is observed in the present. Uh, one in which the butler is guilty and one in which the butler is innocent. But right. the facts are the same. The facts don't change. Again, yeah. we're driving this point home. We're going get yeah. to get to some examples here shortly. That's what's going on in the origins debate. You have the same facts and the interpretation is different. And the interpretation will depend on whatever history you believe is true. Right, so obviously creationists, uh, young earth creationists, we're, we're getting our historical framework from the Bible. Yes. That's, that's where yeah. our presupposition comes from. So everyone else, uh, which includes theistic evolutionists, uh, atheistic scientists, old earth creationists, um, they don't take the Bible as plainly written as the real history right. Right, of the universe, yeah. so, so they get their history from outside the Bible, because right? yeah. you can't find millions of years in Scripture, for example. Right. The real question to ask is, which history fits best? Right. Which history fits best? You have these observations. Which history does biblical history or the millions of years history best explain the observations that scientists are making today? Right. So there are a lot of uh, uh, details we could talk about, a lot of different specific uh, cases, but we'll get into that when we What is something that computers and humans have in common, which constantly needs upgrading in computers, but not in humans? The answer is software. You may not have realized you have software, but inside the nucleus of each of your cells, a program is written in the form of 3 billion DNA letters. Intelligent programmers write computer software, but what about living things? Evolutionists tell us that the information in the first living cell just appeared by itself with no intelligent input required. But is that possible? The answer is a resounding no. Even one of Australia's best-known scientists, Paul Davies, conceded that there is no known law of physics able to create information from nothing. And perhaps that's why, in a New Scientist article, he lamented, how did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software? Nobody knows. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, so the question to ask when you're watching an evolutionary documentary or, or learning about some new scientific discovery is, which history fits best? Let's look at some practical examples to really make this clear. Right, same facts, let's see which history fits best. The current human population growth uh, rate is at 1.2% per okay. year. So uh, uh, less than 0.5% uh, growth from six people 4,500 years ago would produce today's population. Wow, and today's population growth is 1.2%. Right. All you need is half a percent. Right, so which history fits best? The millions of years history or the, or the young earth creationist interpretation? And where are all the people? Exactly, Humans where are all the bodies? For, 20 to, for, for 100 to 200,000 years. And yeah. which history fits best? The history that says people are, are, are younger. That's right. uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Yeah, the, the Earth's magnetic field is decaying at a measurable rate. You can extrapolate that back. You get back to about 10,000 years ago, and the Earth's magnetic field would have been so strong, the Earth would have started to melt. <laughs> Which history fits best? Right. There's a scientific observation, something we're observing today. Which history fits best? The, the history that says that the Earth ain't 4.6 billion years old. Exactly. That's the one that fits best. Recent discoveries of dinosaur blood cells, blood vessels, yes. proteins, hemoglobin, collagen, uh, and DNA with, you know, identifiable DNA Dino within DNA. dinosaur bones. Well, what, what does that tell you? Is, is that, does that indicate they existed 
quite a short period of time ago, or do they exist millions and millions of years ago, and those things have been sitting in, in, in the ground all that time, and somehow they were preserved miraculously. Yeah. Well, again, again here's which an history observation. Fits best? Which history fits best? Well, yep. dinosaurs lived until very recently, apparently. So, right. So, and and the um, another accusation is creationists don't do original research, and that feeds into this this subject as well. Right. Uh, now, this misses the point because the research can be done by anyone. Uh, we often turn to evolutionists to, to get, do the research, to do the observations. Mary Schweitzer, who discovered, the, 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 discovered some of these amazing features in dinosaur bones, right. she's an evolutionist. Right. And the, she's coming up with the facts, right? She's, yes. She's, 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 yes. She's, she's looking at these facts, and we're just saying, yeah, but now we're observing the facts, which, which history fits best right. here, right? Anybody and, can do the science. Yeah. So. Now, the, the other thing is, creationists have done original research, right? Yes. I mean, you look yeah. at the founding fathers of science, yes. what did they believe, in evolution or creation? They were Bible-believing Christians for the, uh, the vast majority of them. For the most them. part, yeah. Right. So, um, you know, many key aspects in biology, as well, as well as other major branches of, of modern science, were, were discovered by creation. So Louis Pasteur, right? discovered that diseases were caused by germs and showed that life comes only from life. If you're an atheistic evolutionist, guess what? You believe life has come from non-life in the past. That's unscientific, yeah. according to what we've we'll observed. We'll show on that. Yeah, <laughs> Gregor Mendel uh, discovered genetics. Uh, Carol uh, Linnaeus, he developed the modern classification system. They're all Bible-believing Christians. Uh, yeah, and a lot of the, original you know, research done there by, by, yeah. uh, by Bible-believing uh, scientists. Exactly. Today, many scientists, I mean, the, the trend continues. Today, many scientists contribute greatly to their field. Yep. Uh, think of uh, Dr. John Baumgartner, the world's leading geophysicist in modeling plate tectonics right. in supercomputers. And so he's considered the world's leading scientist in that area by other geophysicists in that field. Yep. He's a Bible-believing scientist. It, research continues today. Right. So, by the way, original research does need to be done in certain areas it does. To, to, to further the creationist uh, position, and, and that happens. We've seen the rate project and, and different things like that. But I'll give you an example where um, uh, why some of that needs to be done. For example, um, you know, Dr. Carl Werner, he, he, this is a fellow that dedicated his life to going around and, and finding what evolutionists have, uh, have found buried together with, di with dinosaur, or in dinosaur layer rock, let's right. put it that way. Right. What was coexisting with the, with the dinosaurs, you know, uh, in, in these rock layers? Yeah. And of course, he's found out all sorts of things, right? He's found, um, you know, they found platypus with, in dinosaur rock layers. They found yeah. beavers and, and all these types of things. And so, um, see, sometimes evolutionists wouldn't think to look for certain things because of their presupposition. Well. Well, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, and the other creatures hadn't evolved since then. So a lot of times, these people, they weren't even looking for those, yeah, those things. Yeah, and that's what he discovered. So there's some original creationist research. Right. Um, another example of that would be carbon-14 and dinosaur bones. Evolutionists would never think of looking at carbon-14 and dinosaur bones because if they're millions of years old, all the carbon-14 would have been, uh, would be gone. They wouldn't right. think of doing that. That would be something, and that ha creationists have done that. Right. Now, for more answers, on some of this. You need to get a copy of the Creation Answers book. The Creation Answers book will show you how to understand the difference between these two things and it answers a ton of questions. You can get, at, you can get this at 30% off if you use the code, go to creation.com and use the code CMLCAB, Creation Answers book, and uh, there's a special coupon code to get a discount on this, uh, this, this book that has an extremely wide range of uh, of answers to questions to help uh, further your understanding of this vital issue. Many Christians today have a diminished view of the Bible because they can't answer questions like, is there really a God? What about evolution? Are there facts to back up the Bible? Or is it all just faith? Creation Ministries expert speakers visit churches all over the world to help pastors equip their congregations to understand that the whole Bible, even Genesis, is accurate. We help to demolish the arguments that the world uses to try to convince people that the Bible isn't true. For more information on getting a CMI speaker to visit your church, contact your nearest CMI office through our website. All right, welcome back. We're going to, or we've been looking at uh, a vital issue in the creation evolution uh, debate, understanding the difference between observations and the past. It, sh it shouldn't be that difficult, really. Right. We're going to switch gears a bit and uh, wrap up with a feedback. We right. often do that on Creation Magazine Live. Here's a feedback. This was from uh, actually in, in the 1990s. And um, the title of this, this feedback here was Looking Forward to the Eradication of Christianity. So quite a negative feedback right. in this case. 
And uh, A.L. from Nashville, Tennessee writes in and says, Why are you so adamant in your opposition to secular humanism? Is it because you realize that Christians have lost the so-called culture war and that Christianity is on the way out as the primary cultural influence in the West? The eradication of Christianity in educated circles is one of the most positive cultural trends of the past few centuries. Once freed from the smothering grip of Christian morality, the arts and sciences will flourish. I eagerly await the day that Christianity is eliminated from the face of the earth. Then perhaps we will be free from the sort of drivel you publish on this website. <laughs> He's referring, of course, to creation.com, the world's number one source for creation <laughs> information. I'm excited about it. Yeah, I know. He uh, doesn't seem so excited about it. No, he yeah. doesn't. <laughs> so uh, one of our editors uh, got back to this fellow and said, is he serious? <laughs> Science first flourished in the, uh, in the culture of Christian Europe because of the belief in an orderly creator who'd made the universe and given mankind dominion over creation. See how most of the founders of modern, Christ er, modern science were creationists. And as for the arts, has the critic never seen the wonderful paintings and sculptures inspired by Christian themes, by artists such as Michelangelo and Rembrandt, or heard the majesty, er, majestic music of Vivaldi or Bach or Handel's Messiah to name but a few? Apparently not. <laughs> Conversely, how can art or science be logically deduced from the secular humanist credo, God does not exist? And we can certainly imagine that Christian morality, uh, for example, do not murder, don't steal, etc., is smothering to murderers and thieves, <laughs> but most people would be grateful for it. Just remember the brutality in countries which, try, uh, which did try to abolish Christianity, as uh, A.L. here from Nashville uh, desires, uh, for example, the Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, Albania, Cuba, etc. See, many of these people, when they, when they make these comments, it, it's almost like they're ignoring the history that's yeah. set down. You know? yeah. and, and what's the saying? You know, those who uh, fail to uh, learn from history are, are doomed, doomed to, to repeat, repeat it. it. Yeah. I mean, folks, let's take a look at the, the, you know, the past and see what's happened in, in, in these countries where Christian morality is not present. As a matter of fact, even, even Dr., uh, Dr. Richard Dawkins, right? Champion of atheism, but he says, yep. well, I like Christian morality. I, I like yes. evolution as far as, yes. you know, uh, science and stuff like that, but as, I don't like it when it applied to morality and ethics. And, he you wants know. love your neighbors yourself because he realizes that you cannot build a society on evolutionary values. Might makes right, the strong wipe out the weak and so on. That's not a very nice place to live. Right. But if you love your neighbors yourself, that's good. Yeah. And he also said, speaking of Dawkins, he also said that, you know, he's, he's very hesitant to see the departure of, or the eradication, as this fellow here says, uh, the eradication of Christianity because he, he's, the, he suspects, and he's right, he suspects that it might be a bulwark, he says, to something far, to something far greater. Uh, right. Of course, he's over in the UK, and they're talking about uh, the UK becoming a Muslim nation that's right. uh, in just a few years. So I think that's what he's referring to. Want a free copy of Creation Magazine? Go to creation.com slash freemag and get yours, and you can get more information like we've been discussing today. Awesome.